and I'm the administrator with Hospice of Missoula. Thank you guys for coming tonight. I'm gonna turn off my ring here. I, um, I wanted to just briefly talk about how community conversation goes. We have a couple sort of guidelines. I hate to say the, the word rules because I'm kind of against rules and that break them all. Um, and we have two great facilitators. So let's just start with how we sort of go through um, community conversations. There are a couple things that I think are important and I always have to get them again from our awesome chaplain, Greg Rallo, mm -hmm. who gives me the rules. <laughs> and he says, mm -hmm. when you're doing um, a group conversation, it's really, really nice to think of four things. And the first one is to listen deeply. And this just means not to be thinking about what you will ask or say next, but just to be really attentive to what everyone else is saying and really to embrace that. So listen deeply is important. Number two is to speak from the heart. So again, not feeling like you have to have a right or wrong question that anyone will be judging what you say. It's okay to just say whatever is in your heart and that's okay, we'll accept that here. Um, third is to be spontaneous. So if there's something that comes off the top of your head and you wanna ask it, don't feel like you have to second guess that. That's okay here too. So be spontaneous in what you're talking about. And the fourth one is to be brief. And sometimes that's a little bit hard, <laughs> but there are a lot of people that may need to share, so just try to be concise and to be brief and know that you'll have another chance to speak if you have more questions or if there are things that come up for you. So, everyone who agrees, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can all stay there. So we have um, two great um, people here today with us. Eric is our mm -hmm. speaker, and all that Anita introduce him. Anita is an RN. She works with us. Her name is Anita Vatshell. She works for Hospice of Missoula and she has a lot of experience. She said, it's not, I'm not afraid of talking about people who don't want to hear what I have to say. She used to work with Blue Mountain Clinic, so okay. she is edgy and knows what, how to steer a crowd to behave. Um, but she also does intakes for us and she's our call nurse. So at night often if you call, we have a nurse 24 hours a day and, and most likely you'll get Anita. So with that, I'll turn it over to Anita and you can introduce yourself in there. Well, thank you, and um, it's it's kind of exciting to be here tonight because I realized when I knew the speaker was uh, Dr. Eric Kress that there's a whole uh, kind of cycle that's happened in my life. 26 years ago, I moved here to Missoula to take care of the mother of a partner of mine who was dying, and they were neighbors with the Kress family, and so. Uh, mm -hmm. that they had hospice and that was my first interaction mm -hmm. with hospice and to this day I still remember the impact that um, that experience had on me even as a not a family member but part of that experience mm -hmm. and so to tie the hospice and the crest mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. coming back to sure. now 26 year late mm -hmm. 26 years later being uh, mm -hmm. part of hospice mm -hmm. and being able to sit next to Dr. Eric Kress mm -hmm. who um, very recently has taken a very public stand um, on the mm -hmm. aid in dying and compassionate choices and come forward as a family practice physician and somebody who's certified in palliative uh, care to say that he has participated in uh, providing that service and that care to three people, three of his patients. Um, and I think that that was a very bold uh, move and it really, I believe, had some strong influence along with many other stories that happened at the legislature to overturn the House bill that would have made that uh, a, 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 a sentence and fine for physicians who were found to do that service. And so uh, I want to um, just really commend you for taking a stand. Um, I've known Eric also as a physician in the community for all these years and have a lot of respect and I'm very thrilled to be here next to you and can't wait to hear what you say. Okay, good. Warm it up. Thank, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm on, right? Okay, good. Okay, well thank you for that warm introduction and thank you for all coming and talking about this. Um, I think that's one of the big things about the whole issue that came up that we all have to thank 
the folks that brought up House Bill 505 was that it really spawned a lot of conversation that, uh, for people to have. And not only aid in dying, or as they like to call it, physician assisted suicide, but also just, I've had so many conversations with my patients and, and strangers on the street. My wife and I were eating dinner at Vega Pizza one night and I had conversations with six complete strangers that night. And getting your picture in the paper a couple times, you know, kind of allows you to have that conversation. I mean, people know who you are and they kind of come up and, and talk to you. So, but it's, it's overall been great that way. But I've also been a better doctor in a way because I've had more conversations with my patients that should happen. And those are including advanced directive and pulse forms and everything. So there's been a lot of good come of it in that sense. Um, yeah, I'm, my name is Eric Kress. I've been a family physician in Missoula for 26 years, 26, 27, getting to be one of the um, last ones standing kind of in that realm. So, <laughs> um, but I've uh, pretty much been a family physician uh, that you'd normally go see for high blood pressure, cholesterol, and things. But also, I've been um, involved quite a bit in hospice medicine with, uh, for 10 years or so, I've been pretty active in that and is serving as, as medical director of various hospices in town and, um, and also taking care of my own patients that develop terminal illnesses. Uh, you know, that, that's been going on for a long time. So I uh, have a fair amount of experience in that. And then be, during the, uh, I did go ahead and get a hospice palliative care certification. It's called a certificate of added qualifications. And you sort of get that because you have extra practice ex experience of that. And then you uh, study and take a test and you pass it. And then they give this to you. So you, you have to have like a certain number of hours of experience doing this and then take the test. And then they give you a certification, <coughs> just acknowledging that you have this extra training. So. At any rate, I know um, it, it is sort of um, the whole process of kind of talking about this in a public fashion really came about, I mean, you may look at it as an altruistic maneuver, but I really was all about, I like living in Missoula, Montana. I don't want to live in Deer Lodge. I <laughs> don't like wearing orange every day. I is really. Right, I, I sort of, uh, that, it, you know, they, it was sort of a deal where they started it and they, they came out with a bill that would basically say that you're going to jail for 10 years and a $50,000 fine if you even talk about aid in dying. So, okay, that sounds a little un-American because that is in the Constitution that you can talk about stuff, right? Okay, so I guess that's what brought me to this point where I needed to weigh in on this issue. And then um, when that happened, um, you know, when you weigh in and you go public, you know, you better do, you know, as uh, my son has heard me tell him numerous times throughout his 23 years of life, you only have one chance to make a first impression. <laughs> and after that, you're either trying to make up for the fact that you didn't make that good of a first impression. So I really uh, sat down and thought long and hard about how to address this issue. And I did it with the help of a lot of people too. And especially I'd point out Amy um, over there for Compassion Choices helped me a lot. And then her coworker, Emily uh, Bentley, and also just friends who, um, have had experience testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee because that's where the, the, the battle sort of took place or whatever, the meeting of the minds. And so all those people helped me, you know, kind of write and then rewrite to really help me capture, you know, uh, what I felt about this issue. So, um, and in that sense, it came to be a lot of publicity for me, but it, as I would like to explain tonight, it's really about uh, what patients want, what patients need. It's not about what Dr. Kress wants or needs. It's, uh, so I've become sort of the, the poster child for the issue, but uh, the whole issue of why I did this is really not about what, what's in it for me, it's really about what's in it for patients. And, and it was a patient-directed uh, um, decision. It wasn't a 
you know, what does Dr. Kress want to do so he can uh, have, you know, uh, it wasn't about Dr. Kress, it turns out, it was really about what about this patient. And also what is um, legal to do in Montana because that is, uh, we do have a situation where our Supreme Court got together and uh, deeply considered this issue after a long period of time and they voted uh, to say that a person can legally make a decision to take um, a, uh, a medication at the end of your life to relieve your suffering and um, that's within the rights of your, your individual rights. So sometimes when I, it wasn't just Dr. Kress deciding this is legal here. This is, this is also the Supreme Court of the state of Montana, which is elected by all the citizens of Montana. And um, they also said that too. So this, um, rather than, like I say, I feel like this is um, part of the decision that, uh, I just want to explain that it's, I really don't feel like a maverick. Like I'm just doing something crazy or on my own or, or out of what's really legal to do in Montana and what patients asked of me to do uh, to help them with their battle with a terminal disease that they were going to lose. So what I'm going to do at this point, and, and one of the things I've always tried to do is talk about aid and dying, talk about suicide, and I really want to go through um, kind of what aid and dying is, and I think the best way for me to do that because I spent a fair amount of time writing this little speech for the Senate Judiciary Committee on 3:26:13, and you can check it out on YouTube and stuff like that if you want if you want to see the whole thing it's about 12 minutes but I thought I'd sort of cut to the chase and really talk to the talk about the part of it where I made the decision uh, to, to write the prescription and then I want to give you a couple other experiences I've had in my practice <clears throat> and then you know we'll, we'll open up for questions and stuff. Um, so I sort of talked to in this the first part about you know me and you know that I'm really a family doctor and I spend 99 percent of my time basically treating high blood pressure, trying to diagnose cancer. For 17 years I delivered babies, et cetera, et cetera. But this small part of my life, which has been very uh, rewarding, has included hospice medicine and taking care of terminally ill patients. Um, this is what I've also done. Uh, <clears throat> Today I'm going to give you a glimpse into what it is like to be on the front lines of palliative care. To be the person in the room that the patient, the family, and other health care providers look to for advice when considering their options for care at the end of life. I have been that person on countless occasions. Most of the time, compassionate and time-tested palliative care treatments from hospice health care professionals will be all that is needed to guide the person through their dying process in a comfortable fashion. For some patients, however, this will not work. Of these patients, some will have a hard death. By this, I mean that despite the usual four to five medicines used in palliative care, nothing is working. We then have to resort to more and more powerful medications and delivery systems until we enter the realm of terminal sedation. This could involve the use of a general anesthetic. Undoubtedly, these options can shorten lives by hours, days, or weeks. I have never known anyone who has witnessed a person in a pain crisis at the end of life express regret that terminal sedation was used. In fact, they have universally been thankful and grateful that this option existed. Another group of people wish to have more control over the timing and manner of their death and seek me out for advice on the option of aid in dying. Over the years since the Baxter decision, approximately 10 people have consulted with me about utilizing this option. Of these 10, I've written three prescriptions for aid and dying medication. All three patients chose to utilize this option. Two of these 10 patients stockpot, or two of the 10 patients that came to see me to request medic, to talk about medication, stockpiled their medications and then took a large amount to hasten their death and relieve their suffering. 
Of these three patients, all were male and all were rugged individualists. <clears throat> they were all very uncomfortable with the thought of not being able to care for themselves and having family members do personal hygiene, even though all of them had loving family members very willing to do so. <clears throat> all of them stated it was very important to die with dignity and avoid the personal indignity of having others care for their basic bodily functions while they were going to die in a short period of time anyway. One man was poor, one man was middle class, one was rich, two had advanced esophageal cancer, one had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. All three had more than two doctors who had rendered opinions that they were terminal and had plentiful diagnostic testing confirming these opinions. All of them were of sound mind and knew what they were doing. None were depressed. All of them expressed that they had no wish to die. They all loved life and would much prefer to live, but not in the miserable condition that their terminal disease was now dictating them to have. Soon after the Baxter decision, a man with terminal and advanced ALS asked to see me. He was on hospice and wanted me to prescribe aid in dying. He was a wealthy, self-made man who had been credi incredibly active both in his profession and outside activities. The court decision being new, I was hesitant to write a prescription. This man was not used to taking no for an answer. I needed time to think about it. He dressed me down like a marine drill sergeant. Since he could barely speak in a whisper, he spoke with his eyes and wrote down profanities to make sure that he communicated to me that I was a coward. <laughs> this once proud, proud man used to be well over 6'2 and 200 pounds of muscle. He had been completely self-reliant. He had now been reduced to 120 pounds of skin and bones. He had a tube feed but still choked quite often and could not walk. Despite this, he kept trying and was falling constantly. He would often be found weeping and bemoaning the miserable fate that had befallen him. <coughs> On a daily basis, he begged his wife for medication that would end his suffering. Several weeks later, he managed to stockpile enough of his narcotic medications to put down his feeding tube and end his life. But this man had affected me. <coughs> what kind of man or doctor am I? Am I just going to sit idly by watching a proud man suffer and die and not do anything? Or Dr. Kress, are you going to be a man of your convictions and be brave and do what it takes to help people at the end of life? I spent many sleepless light nights after this patient died pondering this question. Sometime after this, a patient of mine was found to have terminal esophageal cancer. He asked me for an aid in dying prescription. He wished to have it available for when his suffering became severe. After meeting with him on several occasions and making sure of his appropriateness to have aid in dying, I wrote him a prescription. He filled it. He was personally greatly relieved at having this option available. He and his family thanked me profusely on every occasion I met with them. I visited with him at his home every two to three weeks to see how he was getting on. He also had other members of the hospice team visiting him and greatly enjoyed our company. After about two months, he began experiencing increasing pain in his chest where his cancer was undoubtedly growing into surrounding tissues. He started taking more narcotics and steroids to reduce pain and swelling of the tumor. This helped for two to three weeks, but then it became obvious to him that his pain was on an unrelenting increase. He could also tell he would only be able to swallow for a short time before his esophagus closed off. He decided it was time. He asked his sister and three of us on the hospice team to be present at his death. We explained to him that we would not aid him in the administration of the medication. He wanted us to be there so he wouldn't be alone. And you know what? We didn't want him to be alone either. No one wants to die alone. He prepared the medication by mixing the contents of 100 capsules in 8 ounces of water and some cherry syrup. Then he opened up a bottle of his beloved Guinness and insisted we all enjoy, join him in a toast. He then thanked me again for having the courage to write this prescription when many others will not. He then told me if there's anything I can use from the, his case to further the cause of making aid and dying available to others that I please do so. Then he sat in a comfortable high back chair. He drank the medication. In one to two minutes his, his speech was slurred. In two to three minutes, he was asleep. His respirations had stopped in five to six minutes. In 12 minutes, his pulse was absent. 
and he had no heart sounds. All of us present at his death were amazed at how peaceful his death was. I had no sleepless nights after this man's death. In fact, I am proud that I had the courage to do the right thing for him. The rest of it just goes on and talks about how you know we shouldn't uh, throw doctors in jail and so forth for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, I, I wanted to, to give you this story because that is the story of what happened uh, in my, that's how my progression of being reluctant to prescribe the medicine and, and, and say ignorant of the legality of it. And since then, I have researched it and talked with experts on it enough to feel very comfortable that it is a legal thing to do. So um, in, in contrast to this, I want to describe two situations in my practice that I think about from time to time because sometimes things happen in medicine and you just can't help but be affected by it. And one of them was when I was a resident physician. I was over in uh, Moses Lake for a month doing like a rural family medicine rotation. And one day I, I had a, uh, a, you know, like a 16 year old male come in. He was a real lean, muscular young man. And he was getting a sports physical for wrestling. And so he, he was kind of quiet and you know, we chatted and stuff, but he seemed you know, perfectly happy and everything and uh, approved him for a sports physical. The next, a week later, I was in the emergency room and um, I get a call, there's a patient coming in with a gunshot wound. And um, in wheels, the stretcher with this young man with a gunshot wound to the head, self-inflicted, and he committed suicide. So, um, you know, that's a vision of seeing this young man who was very handsome and fit, and um, then, you know, a week later seeing him, uh, you know, mutilated and, and basically dead um, in the emergency room. You know, that, that suicide really affected me and, you know, made me really think, you know, that when I'm seeing young people for acne or a sore throat or whatever, you know, kind of try, you know, uh, try to get the radar up for other things that could be going on. And um, I, I assume that he was, uh, as can happen, some people are impulsively suicidal very quickly. And I'll bet that's what happened to this young man. But uh, that to me is suicide. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's one of those situations that I bring up when I'm talking to medical students and, and uh, uh, nurse <coughs> practitioner students, et cetera, just to try to get them thinking that sometimes, you know, obviously in you know, life and in medicine, still waters run deep and you try to gotta, gotta peer down into the depths if you can. Um, it doesn't always work, but, you know, you gotta try to do it. Um, the other case that I remember, uh, I was, uh, I got a call from the, the sheriff's deputy asking me to talk about a patient, and it's never good when you get a call like that. And uh, he, um, a gentleman I'd seen about a year ago, a 40-year-old uh, financial planner, um, he needed some sleeping pills, and uh, you know, like a year after I saw him, he was found dead in, in a park and you know a bottle of pills with my name on it was next to him and he used the pills they'd given him a year ago to commit suicide. That's something that uh, uh, you know that doesn't feel good um, and, and I guess I brought those cases up to sort of point out the difference in what I think suicide is of somebody who's depressed and tragically kills himself um, but really feels that life on earth has become so unbearable in, in whatever uh, way that is, uh, and however fast or quick that was, they, they took their life. Uh, it, and I guess I want, uh, that's part of the whole thing, I, my goal of the whole uh, situation here is to get a whole new terminology going. This is aid in dying, this is helping someone who is going to die at the end of life that really doesn't want to die. And so uh, I really feel it's, it's palliative care. 
Uh, that's how I look at it. That's how I, I do feel bad that I didn't have the clairvoyance to ask this young man, was he suicidal? And I ask people, are they suicidal? <laughs> Several times a week. Um, and really try to prevent suicide in my practice. Um, I don't consider what this, uh, uh, what went on here to be somebody committing suicide. I consider it palliative care, aid in dying, and something very different. Um, so I guess I would, uh, and, and that's my goal from the whole debate, is to sort of try to, you know, get the right terminology for the right situation. Um, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll come to a better understanding of what this is. And, and uh, the other thing I want to kind of explain too is um, it was fearful. I, I've explained this to, to, to folks quite a bit. It was scary to come out on this issue. But it's, <clears throat> I've had so much support on it that it's been incredible. So, um, and I really feel it's been a great relief of a burden that I was carrying by myself. And I feel so, um, uh, I, it, it makes me feel good that I'm not alone in this belief that this should be an option for patients. I also believe strongly that in medicine, <clears throat> we always have to be careful. Doctors shouldn't be trusted with Ser all these serious things to, to make the right decision themselves all the time. Doctors make the wrong decision sometimes. And my example for that is going to be Michael Jackson's doctor. Here's an example of a physician that if he would have talked with another physician and said, I'm going to go over to this guy, this really rich guy's house, and I'm going to, he can't sleep, and I'm going to put him to sleep with propofol, he would have had a universal, like, what the heck are you doing, you idiot? That's crazy. I, I want to have my actions uh, not be just what Dr. Eric Kress thinks should be done, but what society should think sh you know, should be reasonably done and what other of my <clears throat> colleagues think should be reasonably done. I don't want to be out there by myself on a plank or whatever. Um, I want to, I really feel my, a great relief that this is out there and that uh, many people have sort of looked at this situation and said, you know, that's okay and it is legal. So to me it's been a huge relief and uh, to carry uh, uh, and, you know, it really took the issue of House Bill 505 to make me sit down and write what happened and, in a, and then express it in a way. And then, to be honest, if it was just me going to the Senate Judiciary Committee and giving a good speech and maybe even getting people to vote, it would have really died there. And I want to thank Compassion and Choices for being able to uh, through Amy and Emily and, and all the people that have donated money to Compassionate Choices. They have greatly expanded uh, the issue and uh, got a lot of people to think about it and, and uh, address it in the, within their own belief system. And 83% 80, in the last poll believe that this should be available. I'm totally okay if 17% don't think it should be done or wouldn't do it themselves, but I think, you know, should, should what the 17% tell the 83% what to do? I don't think so. And um, I, I think uh, having a public debate on it is, is good, and we should have one. Uh, and I also think that um, when I've done aid in dying, I've always followed uh, on the shoulders of others before me in medicine and in life in general, um, I follow Oregon's set of rules. Um, you, you have to have a competent patient. You have to have at least two healthcare professionals document that this person has a terminal disease. You have to rule out depression, uh, you know, psychosis, things like that. So I, I, I've, I've in a way, it's not just been Dr. Crest going out on a wing and a prayer. I really feel like I've done um, what 
a group of nine learned individuals is say, says okay in Montana, and that has been done in the country <clears throat> and other places. And now that I've talked about it publicly, it's also something that people have had a chance to to look at, and 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 many people have said that's a reasonable thing to do, and um, it may be something I would consider doing. But the the reality is most of us probably won't. Um, <laughs> What I tell people is that this is unique to the person and the disease. You may be a person who would consider doing this, but you maybe don't have the disease that would make you really want to do this. That's very possible. Um, we don't know what, every one of us will um, be dealt a death card eventually. We kind of live in, um, a world where I think we all have that immortality belief that we'll, that they'll die and we won't, uh, but uh, we will in reality, and uh, we could be dealt a card that would have a very tough death. Even if you've lived the most noble, righteous life, you can get a card that is a tough card, and you can get an easy card too. So, but uh, so we don't really know, and uh, that's why I think that uh, when I hear somebody say, well, I want it just to have it, I go, no, that's not happening. You're not going to get this prescription from me to just kind of have it and bank it for the next 20 years or something. So, <laughs> so. so at any rate, I want to um, open it up for discussion now, questions, because uh, I know this is every, everybody... Um, this is a good thing to talk about, and, and it'll generate lots of good discussion. And and uh, like to hear what you think of, of the situation, right. sir. Well, I'd like to. Uh, I know you defer to others in your uh, assessment of your testimony and your stand. But I would like to acknowledge you for your courage, <coughs> your personal courage for mm -hmm. doing what you've done. But my sec, my real question is, where's the, what's the federal statute if, with regards to this kind of? Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I think it's something that has, um, I don't know of a federal statute. And Amy, do you have any thoughts on that or knowledge no, of that? State, state it's okay. a state issue. It's a state issue, I guess. And um, the other thing is, you know, there's sort of what does the House of Medicine say on it? Yeah. And uh, I guess there is some statement in the AMA about it you know, that we're opposed to physician-assisted suicide, and I guess I'd say, fine, but how about Aiden dying? <coughs> um, <laughs> let's talk about something different here. I'm opposed to doctors <laughs> writing <laughs> prescriptions to help people commit. Does it become semantic in a certain sense? I think it has in a certain sense, and I think we got to, I, I think that the, the trouble is most, many people refer to assisted suicide as this. And so we have to deal with the words as kind of one and the same. So I'm just going to take every opportunity to say we're talking about physician-assisted suicide, but I considered aid in dying, and I try to bring up these contrasts and you know just kind of get people to really understand that this is aid in dying more than it is physician-assisted suicide. So I think it's just it obviously if you look at how these things play out in the press, um, you know, if you, you can you can light some buttons if you say <coughs> physician assisted suicide. And you can uh, throw some cold water on that by saying aid in dying, that's okay, you know. So it is it is a it, it is a, a bit of a war of, of beliefs and terminology and what works and and in reality there's there's like a 5% over here and a 5% over here, and then there's a big middle ground, and you know the, the middle is kind of not always thinking about it every day or anything, but they're, they're, you try to uh, kind of win your argument to, to that group of people in the middle, and um, I, I think that's, that's sort of what goes on. And so when most people understand that what this was, what this is, uh, and when I learned what it really was by being in the room with a person asking me for this, that was, I mean, I was a person who learned along the way too. It wasn't automatic that you knew what to do or what to think or what, you know, and so I think, um, I do think though that medicine, I think medicine as often happens will be led by society on this issue and the, the converse won't happen. 
and I give one example. I, I'm on the uh, board of trustees of the Montana Medical Association, and an ER doctor in Helena came up with a good idea that we should pass a resolution that patients should get a pulse form and an advanced directive and everything. And I said, okay, they passed it and everything, and they discussed it, and, um, but then they didn't do anything. So it dies in this little obscure committee and it never goes anywhere. And I guarantee you they're not going to cut a $200,000 check, which Compassion and Choices did, to publicize this issue. So they are going to be ineffective on this issue and they're not going to be a player. Um, and I think that's probably going to happen with aid and dying is when they see for 10 years that 80% of people believe that this should be something that be reasonable, then medicine will go, well, let's have a resolution and it's okay now. But it's not going to happen that the House of Medicine is going to say, get out. If it was, if it was 80% of people were against it, I guarantee you they wouldn't battle upstream and say the converse. So they will be led by society um, and, uh, and I doubt if they'll lead society on this issue. Go ahead over there. Yes, I, I'm curious, you mm -hmm. mentioned the 83, 17% kind of approval rate, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. among the population. Ma, I'm curious about the physician population here locally, whether you've um, received um, support in that great a number um, for them or not. Uh, not so much. <laughs> no, it really, I would say they're very... Uh, Who do we need to talk to for you? Well, we, yeah. it'd be good to get... Uh, I haven't... Um, I've, I've had some physicians that have definitely been very supportive. Uh, Dr. Steve Speckert. Um, and um, he's been great. Um, but there's been a physician in Bozeman. But it, it has been kind of mum from most of them, and including the, the people I work with most closely. Um, the president of Muscle Montana Clinic, Tom Roberts, has been a strong supporter of this. Um, but I have really no idea what the rest of my call group feels about it. They, uh, they haven't um, really wanted to talk about it, and I've sort of given him a couple openings, like, yeah, we just had to go to Helena for this thing on aid and dying and oh okay you know then just kind of gone so I it is kind of strange I think that um, it's been amazing how many how many people want to talk about it, how many people have come up on the street and how many patients want to talk about it and it's been kind of um, a little bit amazing how little my colleagues have wanted to talk about it I don't know if I'm kind of radioactive or what but um, I guess um, that that's just the, that's kind of the response I've gotten, and you know, it's it's just kind of is what it is. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's good or bad. That that's what it is. <laughs> so here I am talking to all of you, and I really haven't had a big conversation <laughs> with the rest of my colleagues that I interact with. Kay, do you have something there? Eric, number one, what is the definition, your definition of terminal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mom's 89. Mm -hmm. She's almost mm -hmm. completely blind mm -hmm. with macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. She's deaf. Mm -hmm. She can scarcely get up and mm -hmm. move around. Mm -hmm. All she wants to do is die so she can be with dad. Mm -hmm. She asks me, mm -hmm. day near mm -hmm. on a daily basis, isn't there something you can give me? Mm -hmm. Don't you have a pill? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when our neighbor, mm -hmm. Barbara, died, mm -hmm. right. she said, when is it going to be my turn? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> she yeah. gets mad mm -hmm. when somebody dies. Mm -hmm. When's it going to be my turn? Mm -hmm. um, heart failure and oxygen. And mm -hmm. she's, she's in congestive heart failure. Mm -hmm. Mom really wants to die. Mm -hmm. She really does. She'd just love to be able to go to sleep and not wake up the next mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. Is she a mm -hmm. candidate for... Well, I think that um, I do tell people that I would be willing to look into a situation for other patients that would consider this. Uh, but I certainly 
I always tell people when I first talk with somebody, and I just I spoke with somebody on the phone from you know uh, Eastern Montana today actually about it, and I said, you know, one of the things I want to make sure we understand is I never I never say I'm going to make a decision until I know the person, until I've seen the person or talked to them and review their medical records. Mm -hmm. So for any decision, um, you know, it would, ne it would never be right for me to kind of just say offhand that this would be appropriate or I would write a prescription. It would have to be done at the end of a serious deliberation over numerous visits, say a month or two. Then I might write the prescription. So, but I certainly think um, that would be that would be kind of my, my statement on that, um, and that um, I wouldn't. Uh, and that's why I think it, you know that's when, when when we look at this issue here of ten people coming to me with inquiry about doing this. You know, I wrote it on three occasions, mm -hmm. and um, they all happen to be male. I would say, you know, for whatever reason. But for various reasons, I wouldn't write the prescription. And some of those reasons were, and I'll just throw these out there, were that people had, um, I didn't really want to have somebody that didn't really have a clear vision that this is, I, did, I had no problem talking to somebody about it and see if they would develop a clear vision if they wanted to do this. But I really didn't want people to be somebody who didn't have a clear vision of this is for sure what I want to do and their circumstances were the right ones. So if somebody was sort of, um, you know, indecisive, um, and also there's some factors involved in the whole process for the, which for some people were a hurdle. One is that the medicine costs approximately, this medicine that we talked about here, the, it was second all, that costs about um, $1,500. So it wasn't something, you know, some, there were some people that literally couldn't afford it um, and then didn't really want to necessarily buy the medicine if it was sort of a maybe use it. They were more like, well, I wouldn't mind having it around in case I wanted to use it, but for 1500 no thanks. Uh, <laughs> so, and um, I also had a family member come to me uh, with terminal stomach cancer, or a person come to me with stomach cancer that I spoke with her and she was considering doing it, but she had a very strong Catholic family. And she requested that we don't tell the family this happened. And I counseled her that I don't think this is a good idea. I don't think the last thing you do on this earth should be something that you don't feel comfortable telling your family. And it was really more of a, I think, just a counseling her about what her options were, that her, her pain could be palliated. And, and, and like I say, most of the time that can happen. And that doing something that I wouldn't want to assume that this will be kept a secret because people will find out, then um, then somebody's mad at me or you, and they have all this unresolved guilt and anger. And you know, if you're a strong, there are people that have you know strong religious beliefs that say you're not going to go to heaven if you do this. So um, that could be cause serious grief repercussions in the family. So. I counseled her that I didn't think it was wise for her to do this. And so there's a lot of reasons why somebody might not decide eventually to do it. Um, and certainly um, the, um, yeah, so I think there's always these situations that we don't want it to be a hasty decision. If somebody is, sometimes they would come to you and they're going to die within a week or two and it was really not, this is time for you know, do what hospice does. They will take care of you. It wasn't time to sort of address all the issues that needed to be addressed for me to feel comfortable writing this prescription. Any other questions or anything back there? Okay. There, there seems to be this interesting chasm between the idea of administering and the idea of withdrawing. Like, um, you know, the idea of withdrawing. Like, a person who chooses to ask the physician for aid and dying measures versus the patient who decides to withdraw food and water. And fast, you know, and then go that way. And we 
you don't hear a lot about that. Mm -hmm. and that's what is the same in both is about the patient's choice. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if there's any conversation about that in the medical ethics world or I guess the um, <laughs> I don't I mean I think there are at some levels um, in many ways withdrawal of medical support i.e. tube feeding or something can can be very similar in my view to to uh, aid in dying um, but not everybody thinks that way um, the <clears throat> I'm as you know I'm more of a <laughs> I don't want to generally take things to ethics committees because <laughs> it's going to get battered around and uh, maybe um, <clears throat> something that doesn't feel right might happen at the end of the day with a giant ethics committee and um, the most of the time the, the ethics committee should be the family the person and you know doctor nurse social worker uh, hospice chaplain whatever that that's a good ethics committee let's go with that one yeah. <laughs> it's not involved well, one thing, if you're not a board in a of a large organization, say like a hospital, you know, and <laughs> if you think about Montana being mm -hmm. one of the st mm -hmm. uh, states with mm -hmm. the strongest right to privacy, mm -hmm. making a decision mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. withhold or withdraw yeah. from eating or taking in any nutrition or drinking, um, kind of falls very much under mm -hmm. kind of the notion mm -hmm. of that right. And I think yeah. where we run into mm -hmm. some concerns and issues where, yeah. you know, this influence or mm -hmm. an ethics committee mm -hmm. is facility mm -hmm. driven. Mm -hmm. You know, if somebody's in their private home, then mm -hmm. it really goes to what you said yeah. in terms of the family members mm -hmm. and their comfort level mm -hmm. and being able to support that. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the ethics committee thing. It's, it's just so much. We don't hear yeah. about that. Mm -hmm. you know, no. Because in hospice, as you know, that yeah. Kind of yeah, and that's why I think it is. Um, you know, when you look at uh, issues like uh, Karen Ann Quinlan, Terry Schiavo, these are issues that are decided probably once a week in a city the size of Missoula. Somebody withdraws a tube feed or decides not to put a tube feed in every week in Missoula. It doesn't end up in the courts. It doesn't end up in the Congress. <laughs> people looking for political the political strategy on this issue and it doesn't end up in the newspapers and the news shows it gets decided by people and um, that's how it happens 99.999 percent of the time only on rare occasions when you get a situation is politically dramatized mm -hmm. by um, some, I, and that's why I say generally this happens in a very humane, loving way in the privacy of people's homes or institutions, uh, including hospitals mm -hmm. as well. So. I guess part of what I hear Kathy is saying is when people ask you about physician aid and dying, do you ever offer up that education also to say, you, I mean, we all do have that power in some way. And we did have a community conversation about it, you know, a couple of months ago, so it was interesting to hear another physician talk about sure. that and her own experiences in that way. So, yeah, I don't think we addressed that enough. Sure, yeah, I guess I don't have too many people sort of throw that in the mix, like the starvation thing, uh, you know, not eating. But I, it's definitely happened, and uh, but I haven't had that many people talk to me about it, so... Has, have other people had that experience in, in the hospice world? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're telling you nurses. Oh, yeah. yeah, they're probably talking to the nurses. Mm -hmm. By the time I get involved, it's another level or something. Yeah, okay, yeah. Lawrence? Yeah, I, I think that the way I'm taking uh, Kathy's question, um, mm -hmm. the question of dialogue and conversation about, about a subject like this, um, you know, 
I'm sure, as you say, it's happening on a small scale in mm -hmm. small mm -hmm. units mm -hmm. of our community families. But it does seem like there is more interest in having a conversation on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, it's great to have a, the question and answer. Yeah. And thank you very much for, for being here to do that. Right? Sure. Yeah. But it's also, we, we need to figure out how to start having these conversations yeah. with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, sir? <coughs> I've got a um, family member who's really terrified of going into assisted living or a nursing home for the idea that she's going to lose control and she's one of the rugged individualists. Mm -hmm. um, she's thinking that uh, you know, then you'd have to involve one other, that they became mm -hmm. one other housing of the mm -hmm. decision and she just absolutely does not want that to happen. Is there, is there um, ways of circumventing these institutions such as Catholic Hospital or, or any mm -hmm. of the assisted living centers? Do they, have, do they have a vote in whether or not this is going to happen and when? Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have a vote in it. A um, couple issues come up there when I just think of somebody who's maybe have their health is failing, they might need to be in assisted living. And one of the criteria for writing this prescription is mental clarity. And so is your loved one, does she have mental clarity? Can she tell me who the, and the way I assess mental clarity is pretty simple. You know, do you know who the president is? Do you know who the vice president is? Do you know who the governor of Montana is, the new one? Do you, can you? Uh, Shoot. Yeah, 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 so, okay. So you have to be able to document that. And so that is an issue that comes up is that people can, um, you know, 50% of people at age 85 will have dementia. So half of us are gonna have it. So. That's the new normal. We didn't die. The good thing is we didn't die of something else, but your prize for getting there is you're going to have some dementia. So um, I think that, you know, that is a whole other issue that, uh, you know, uh, probably at some point uh, will be difficult to address, more difficult than this one, when it's your person deciding <clears throat> and carrying out the act. I do think for assisted living, um, you would have um, the ones that I know of in town, it would be, there would be enough privacy there to sort of do something like this. But, um, you know, they don't let you, at a hospital, they don't let you take your own Tylenol or aspirin, let alone, you know, 10 grams of phenobar or whatever. So <laughs> I think that would be not the right place for it. But um, uh, the, um, I think, you know, there are assisted livings in town where you could do, some, you know, somebody could elect to do something like that. They definitely take care of hospice patients. Mm -hmm. They definitely um, are comfortable with people dying in their facility, a, a number of them are. So I think that could happen. The, the issue of um, tube feeding and uh, so forth, that is a medical intervention. A hundred years ago, nobody got a tube feed. This is a new thing. It's, it's, not nat it's not natural to have a tube feed. It's a medical intervention that we do when we think it will help the patient and that you can decide not to do if you don't think it's helping the patient. And so I think that um, some doctors have a real hard time pulling a feeding tube. I don't. It's, Sometimes a tube feeding, if you have somebody, a common example would be um, anoxic encephalopathy. Somebody has a heart attack, they're found down, they get revived, they're in the hospital, they're in a coma. You don't know if they're going to come out of the coma. I've seen some doctors do TPN, i.e. IV feeding, but a better way to do it is to put in a tube feed. It's safer, it's less expensive, it works better. And then you know what, after two weeks, no signs of life. This person had made it known that they don't want a tube feed. The family uh, has a surrogate decision maker. 
has been appointed, you know, then it's, it's, this person is, you know, brain dead, then you can remove the tube feeding. And that was the best way to give that person nutrition at this time in their life. And, and now it's, it's not really indicated you know, uh, or it's reasonable to withdraw that medical support that was never something that was on this earth till a hundred years ago or so. I'm not sure when they start doing it, but in that range. When that happened to anybody before a hundred years ago, they died. That was, it was, that would, that was what would happen. So I think we have to understand that, uh, you know, everything's new. And when, I've had some people tell me, ask me, well, why don't you just let people die naturally? And I tell them nobody dies naturally. I'm not dying naturally. I'm, I'm going to live a long time, I hope. And, uh, and most of you are going to take advantage of medicine to live longer, to live better. We all, I assume there's maybe somebody in here that didn't get a vaccination, but I'll bet you all, uh, more than likely all of you have gotten one. And so you've decided not to die naturally <laughs> because you've taken a vaccine to not do that. Um, I take medication, so I live longer and uh, prosper and that sort of thing. And uh, we don't drink out of a ditch like a lot of people in the world do. And, and most, a lot of kids in the world die at age two of childhood diarrhea. They never make it past two. That's dying naturally. So we've all forgot that we don't do that anymore. We die, we live unnaturally long lives. Um, and we, um, we want our doctors and our healthcare providers and nurses and everybody else to help us live longer and live better. And then I think also when it gets too, life's too big of a burden, we can also look to the healthcare system to help us die better and die uh, with less suffering. Um, yeah, <laughs> so go ahead, sir. I appreciate, Doc, what you're doing, uh, sticking your neck out for everybody here. Like you say, who's ever dealing the cards, everybody in this room will hope you have a good deck. Yeah, uh, right, exactly. I, mean, I, got, I got a little uh, shook up last week when uh, they were talking about how many World War II vets are losing a day and stuff. Right. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what I'm yeah. Here today, but, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, like, like you say, you know, if you don't have Alzheimer's by the time you're 85, so I'm 86, so I don't. Yeah. I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, you look like you're doing pretty good there. So <laughs> you got that twinkle. Thank okay. You Thank you. You bet. Um, do you have a question there? Very briefly. So. Bottom line, it is legal to have assistance in dying if you have a terminal disease. Yes, and you fulfill, say, the organ criteria, which would be competency, um, terminal, right. and uh, not depressed. Right. That's my, you know, those and are the organ. Yeah, and what? Eighteen. Eighteen. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, as far as a living will. You have five or seven different people taking sure. care of someone. Um, my grandma had a living will, and one of the girls called 911, and they revived her from a third stroke, and she was right. serious. Mm -hmm. But if you have that living will posted on the fridge, someone calls 911, someone's down, um, they panic. Mm -hmm. Now, 911, yep. do they obvious? Do they look on the fridge, or should you give your local fire department a copy of that? Or, um, what happens now? I, well, I think um, that is a tough issue because it does get missed in the whole process. Um, I do think, and, and we've had some discussions at uh, other meetings regarding this about, um, and like I've told people, we, we have a right to free speech, to own a gun in the Constitution, but why did somebody decide we have to have a code before we check out of this world because a code is a medical intervention that is uh, useful in some situations but for many it's not in fact a code is a bad thing to do to a person and every nurse you talk to in a hospital or every doctor that's been a resident where you do the codes in the hospital and every ER doctor knows that there are just worthless codes mm -hmm. and ones that actually cause pain, suffering, 
it's a brutal procedure that is um, often not very uh, not very useful for that a, per, a certain patient. If you take middle-aged people that have a heart attack in an airport and somebody can shock them within 10 minutes, then it's a useful procedure. But when you take old, frail people nearing the end of their life, often with you know bad lungs, bad heart, damaged brains, either strokes or dementia, and you do a code to them, it is, there's no question. That is a, uh, not a beneficial procedure. In fact, it's a um, damaging procedure. I don't understand why we actually have to offer that person a code because of a piece of paper. And I, I, uh, I also like I always uh, I've told people this. People do use clinical judgment on whether to do a code or not. And um, for instance, if you were. If everybody has to have, I, we, we got into this a little bit because of there's certain um, issues with regards to whether you could not call a code or not on a hospice patient that didn't have the piece of paper. And my, my attitude is we shouldn't code hospice patients. Just, just not do it. We shouldn't offer them this procedure, which is what if they want to have a code? It's ask you, request you for a code. And I would say, no, we shouldn't give them a code. Because they, if, I, if a patient comes in to me and says, you know, I've got a sore throat, and I swab their throat, and it's viral, I don't have to give them an antibiotic. Well, they wanted the antibiotic. Well, do I have to give them an antibiotic? No, I don't. So they can probably go somewhere else and get it, but I'm not going to give it to them. Just because somebody wants a code, if they're at the end of life, this is not an indicated procedure. Uh, you can back that up with statistics, too. Uh, the risk, the, the chance of surviving a code if you're, you know, over 70 with heart and lung problems is less than 1% and your chance of getting out of the hospital or nursing home is like 0.001% and your chance of breaking ribs and suffering greatly is, you know, 90%. So I just think there's a lot of medical data to show that this is not an indicated thing for people at the end of life. Um, even if they haven't signed the paper. So I, I just think that's how, I think this is a process, this is maybe my own little crusade or whatever, but I think it's one that if you talk to any nurse in a hospital or any uh, ER doctor, there's nothing they hate worse than doing codes on people that are dead and um, should be let die peacefully. So they when, if 911's called, they come, they have to do it. Well, no. you if have to show any, them the piece of paper if, if you've got it. Still. Yeah. Okay. So, <coughs> you know, they won't automatically look mm -hmm. somewhere. You no, got to Yeah, and that's they why I think. They should be trained to do it. They're supposed to. They, yeah. they, they do probably look out for that. But I think what I would suggest is that that's where, that's one of the things why I think it's really <coughs> really important for hospice to get involved with end-of-life situations. Everybody sort of takes a deep breath and says, oh, they're on hospice, well, we wouldn't want to code them. And so I think if, uh, which is great, because that's actually where this person's at in life. They're, even if they're not, uh, I mean, it, there is a, an issue sometimes with, with hospice about, you know, sometimes we don't get referred patients early enough and it's like the last week or something and you know we can't really get to know the patient we can't really get to do as much for their benefit and also when somebody gets on hospice they um, all, a lot of that melts away about the code and everything and I would like to see us take off the table the whole thing of we got to give a code unless somebody signed the piece of paper. Well, sometimes the person has dementia and the family member, quite frankly, doesn't understand. Now we have a person who doesn't understand what a code is and they're deciding to give this person a code. I don't think we should have to give that person a code. Um, and I think we should revisit that issue and we should just say, you know, a code isn't indicated for dementia. It's not. <laughs> 
you're right. you're harming the patient more than helping them. And I don't think we should do things that harm people more than help them. So, uh, any, sir, any legal ramifications if the family doesn't call nine one one? I mean, to me, no. if they don't want to live. No, you shouldn't ask for help. Yeah, that's right. You know, why call nine one one? You just ask. I think that's a good point. You know, you do, um, and that's where when when hospice gets on board, they have a person to call. That's the hospice yeah, nurse. Right. Then they we talk to the nurse exactly if the hospice needs to be that person and. It is, um, it is um, a great relief to, to, to patients um, to have somebody to talk to that's experienced with it. And one of the things I've talked to social workers and hospice workers, chaplains and nurses about is that sometimes we, we err on the side of letting, I, I, <laughs> this is fine. I, you, we, we do like to have patients involved in their decisions and so forth. And, you know, kind of be teaching them and, and helping them educate them about what is happening here. But at some point, you sometimes have to jump in and, and understand that you're the person that has experienced dozens or hundreds <laughs> of hospice death experiences. And you have knowledge that they don't have. Most of us, I look at my life. I've had my mom die, my brother die, and my dad died last year. So, well, this is all over 20 years and stuff. You know, it's sort of like, we, if we go around the room, everybody's had that happen. So, what I'm saying is, if I'm just looking at my own personal experience for how to handle death and dying, i am only got three patients I've been intimately involved people I've been intimately involved involved with. So yeah, you get better each time, but you know, three is only three. Well, uh, hospice professionals have dealt with this uh, dozens or hundreds of times. And so they bring a wealth of experience about how to process it, how to think about it. And so sometimes you have to sort of weigh in on the issue a little bit in, in subtle ways. Um, and one example I, I bring up is, is doctors who don't always do it in a way that I view as, as good. When you're talking about, say, a tube feeding issue, I've heard doctors do this. And, and, and probably the nurses can tell me some more stories about what's happened to But I've heard a doctor say this about a tube feeding issue with a dementia patient. You wouldn't want your loved one to starve, would you? Oh. And what if, what if you say, I go through the whole process of talking to him about how tube feeding and dementia hasn't really shown that people live very much longer and they don't suffer you know, during the, 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 the starvation process and this and that and everything, and they're not really asking for food or anything. In fact, if you're forcing food in, you know, they just get aspiration and stuff. Sometimes, what if a doctor says this? This is what I say. Sometimes the kindest thing is not to do anything at all. What do you think your percentage of whether the patient gets a tube feed happens or not with those two scenarios? You're going to have to have a patient that really feels strong about not having a tube feed put in their loved one to say, look, doctor, you're FOS, and uh, we're not putting a tube feed in, OK? And uh, so I think that's where you have to understand that you're the person. I've cared for people with dementia in, in tube feeds. And you know, it's, 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 it's at the end of a brutal seven to 10 year campaign, and then you're maybe going to extend it two to three months with bed sores and you know aspirations and you know you're going to take this person this is where i i think you have to give the person the right information and here's the what i think the right information is okay we'll take your loved one down to the hospital where they don't know anybody and we give them a big whopping dose of versed and we'll have the gi doctor take a trocar and ram it in your guts stick a tube in and then they'll wake up and they will have absolutely no knowledge of where they are and they'll be totally confused. It might take a month or two when these people come back from the hospital for them to settle down to where they're calm and where they aren't shrieking in pain and 
and fear. Mm -hmm. So this is why I think you have to give the real, all the information on what it means to get a tube feed mm -hmm. with end state dementia. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. I think that when you look at all this, if you just say to them, okay, let's just put a tube in, there'd be no problem. The, the GI doctor will see them for maybe five minutes and be gone. And then the nurses, a trocar is like a, uh, basically a pointed stick <laughs> that's sterilized, <laughs> that they jab in your gut after putting a endoscope down so they can watch it go into the gut. And many times these folks will pull them out within two to three days. That's why I say the whole tube feeding experience is a terrible one for dementia patients. And unless you're fully, and that's why I say, you know what, I, you really have to fully inform the family about what's going on here. And it's, you know, if you do fully inform them, then I think they have a very good chance of making the right decision. But I, I do say that um, I probably am someone who, and it's sort of, I'm sort of editorializing a little bit when I say, you know, sometimes the kindest thing is to not do anything. And I do believe that with, in my heart. And that is, and then if they, if they say, put the tube feet in, then I say, okay, this is what will happen. We're going to talk about the big sharp stick and uh, the confusion, the agitation that can occur. So I think that's where medicine has to be real honest with people, including that, you know, when you talk about a code, you really have to be honest about that. If a lot of people go in the hospital and the, the doctor says, do you want, if your heart stops, do you want us to restart it? She, you damn right I want you to restart it. No, do you want me to shock you five times with 300 volts of electricity, jam a tube down your throat that might go into your stomach, and then um, uh, give you chest compressions that will more than half the time in these old folks break ribs, cause pneumothoraces, and then you'll be on a ventilator for a week while you're brain dead and then die. So it's just, that's what the truth is. And um, uh, that's why I just think sometimes we really shouldn't be offering this futile treatment that is um, actually harmful. Go ahead, Minnie. Eric, I have a, a comment and a question. Sure. A comment as a healthcare provider. Thank you for bringing this issue it. to yeah. the forefront. Mm -hmm. You know, as baby boomers, we mm -hmm. push the <laughs> right. envelope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one question I have is when people have terminal illness, they're approaching the latter part of their life. What is normal depression about that versus mm -hmm. depression that would prevent aid and die? Mm -hmm. Can you say yeah. something about that? That is a tough one, and I think it is certainly possible, and, and certainly um, that could be a, a shade of gray area that, that we could get into with a person that is depressed, wants to die, but has a terminal disease, and so forth. And so I would, um, you know, it hasn't really been an issue in these patients, which is great, you know, because it makes it cleaner. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm sure it'll come up. Um, and the way I would address that is, is I would want them to consider whether um, they should be treated for depression. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would probably want to have more conversation with, say, you know, a counselor, either through hospice or a social worker, <laughs> and just kind of getting to the bottom of this person's situation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, of whether they, you know, their depression could be, be treated or relieved by counseling or medications. We certainly put a number of hospice patients on antidepressants. Mm -hmm. And um, and they get, you know, to be honest, they get a lot of talking to, a lot of talk therapy from all the staff. So mm -hmm. um, that is incredibly beneficial. Many people have really full lives and full families. <laughs> But what can happen a lot of times is when you're, when you're the last one standing from your family um, and uh, all your friends have died and um, it's pretty lonely. That's tough and it's not easy. 
Um, and so there is, that's a huge issue. And some people are better at making new friends after their loved ones die and, uh, you know, or their friends die and other people aren't so good. Um, and so there's undoubtedly is depression there. And when people go on hospice, a big part of the therapy of hospice is this milieu of really nice people that come into your life and really make it better. Which, so that's, that's another really great reason for, and you know what, they can't do it in a week. So they really need to, the Not six well. months <laughs> thing, pretty they're pretty good. They'll, they'll, they'll be greatly appreciated within a week, but they do it so much better if they get three to six months yeah. to really get to know people. And I think it's a little bit of a tragedy when there are people that have a ton of family and a ton of friends and they, they get what they need, but there are a lot of people that hospice helps that they don't have that family and you know maybe there are nice people that go on hospice and there are not nice people that go on hospice okay and you know what they didn't really work that well with other people and they burned a lot of bridges with their family but this is their family and it's really you really feel uh, gratified that um, hospice did that because otherwise these people literally would die all alone and it's, that's a tragedy. Um, and also many times through the process of hospice, you see people be able to patch up some relationships um, and that they could patch up. Um, so that is, that is uh, that's really great to see. Um, so I think that is, a, but that would be a concern um, I can't say it would make me less likely to maybe write a prescription until that process had happened. So if somebody was like, you know, well, I've got a terminal diagnosis, but I'm not on hospice, and I don't want to talk to anybody, and I'd pretty much say, you know, I'm not going to write it. Yeah, I mean, I mm -hmm. can see upon getting your diagnosis mm -hmm. of a terminal illness, you're going to mm -hmm. have yeah. depression on that. Mm -hmm. But as they... Mm -hmm live mm -hmm. with that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I imagine sure. that some people come to grips with that mm -hmm. and aren't depressed mm -hmm. towards the end, mm -hmm. but it would yeah. must be really hard discerning mm -hmm. that. It would be, yeah, and, and it, um, yeah, that's, a, that's one of the shades of gray that certainly will come up, I'm sure. <laughs> Last question, sure. with yeah. Alzheimer's, okay, we mm -hmm. all know Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. to me it's a terminal disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So early on in the disease, I mean, you're mm -hmm. pretty functional and mm -hmm. can still enjoy things mm -hmm. in life. And if you've written in your advanced directive, should I develop Alzheimer's dementia, mm -hmm. I would choose to, mm -hmm. you know, forego mm -hmm. life-saving mm -hmm. interventions, etc. But at some point, what I've noticed about Alzheimer's patients is that they seem to live forever. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. And they, in the later stages, cannot make that decision. Mm -hmm. So then does that become the representative's decision, their medical power of attorney? Not at this point in time. That would be, it's really the whole premise of the Supreme Court decision was kind of, you have to be in charge of your faculties, both <coughs> mentally and physically enough to give the medicine. Now you could for instance, maybe inject something in a tube feed or something too, if you had ALS or something. But that would be, you know, it wouldn't be um, something. I, I do think that um, when you look at Alzheimer's, certainly these people have sort of screened themselves out of they're not the people that got heart disease at 50. They're not the people that got breast cancer. And so there is a constitution that some of these people have that they don't die young. And, and uh, so they've sort of self-selected them out into this group and unfortunately the brain uh, does, do, does kind of go on. Um, also, when we look at these folks, you know, certainly I think if we get a more mature attitude, a more realistic attitude about dementia, that it's common and going to be normal. 
in the future, whereas it wasn't in the past. Think about, um, okay, somebody's a little confused. Mm -hmm. They might have a UTI. Do we want to treat that? Mm -hmm. One way to die would be urosepsis mm -hmm. or a, uh, a bed sore gets infected. They get cellulitis. Do we treat that or not? Um, that's many, many people live through dozens of potentially life-ending illnesses because medicine intervenes. And so I think that's where, um, that's where I think the money is on dementia in terms of treating it. Should we give them flu shots? Okay, I, I think because of the fact that, uh, I mean, that is it's not natural to get a flu shot, you know, that's a medical intervention, okay? That uh, certainly, but that prevents pneumonia, the old man's friend. And so um, I think those are issues. Uh, if um, somebody gets a bowel obstruction, you know, with dementia, do we operate? Um, we treat many of those illnesses very aggressively. And um, we could change the, you know, somewhat of the, some of that landscape if we did something different on that. Yeah. So. Right. So patients, families can't make that decision to get physicians. Well, the surrogate, dying, the surrogate decision maker. To not have right. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You have some power, but mm -hmm. not that one. Right. right. That's all. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so that's when you're thinking of yourself. When you're thinking of eighty, fifty percent of us at age eight, the biggest risk factor for dementia is. <clears throat> old being old so as you write in your advanced directives you know when you say when I lose my faculties do you want to have antibiotics for urine infection do you want to have antibiotics for pneumonia do you want to be hospitalized and make that clear if you don't mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sir well, I've got uh, been dying off with Parkinson's and so mm -hmm. I've got frozen blood syndrome Mm -hmm. And the balls of my feet are got peripheral neuropathy, so I can't feel them anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm losing my motor skills, and I've been warning my family. Some of these days, when I fall, I can't get up, and I get a hold of a gun, I'm going to put my hand to it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, some of them think I will, some of them think I won't. Mm -hmm. But uh, at what point? Would you have to be in more pain, apparently? Um, well, <clears throat> yeah. First, as I told my family doctor, as quick as my foot quits moving and mid stride when I'm walking sometimes, mm -hmm. that I'm going to seriously consider getting out of picture. Mm -hmm. And he asked me, he said, Well, George, are you depressed? And I said, No, I don't think I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm damn frustrated. <laughs> so that sounds much better because I've been right active. Yeah. I've hunted for 50 years, mm -hmm. skied for 40, and ran for 40. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to me, to not be able to walk is not being alive. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, to me, it's a big, big advantage to me to know that I'm not going to outlive my money unless I have a stroke or get paralyzed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna wait for the disease to take over mm -hmm. and shut down every damn part of my body. Well, sir, I wouldn't really at a public meeting. I wouldn't make any kind of <laughs> decision. Okay, but uh, there, there can be. Um, you certainly dementia is one of a number of many neurodegenerative diseases which people will die from, including Parkinson's, mm -hmm. ALS, um, you look at, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Huntington's disease, mm -hmm. um, there's uh, different types of dementia they figured out now. So I think that um, there will be a sort of, this could be a situation where um, some, you know, I, I could see potentially uh, somebody with Parkinson's getting a prescription for the medication. Whether your case would be appropriate or not, I certainly wouldn't want to make any statement on that tonight. 
but um, it could potentially be a situation where it could. Uh, it, it is one of the facts of Parkinson's that there is frequently a dementia that does develop with it at some point in time that, um, uh, that could make that difficult. Mm -hmm. I had a pacemaker put in two years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, the nurse came up to the room and said, Mr. Lucker, you ever consider hurting yourself? And I said, yeah. She said, how often? I said, every day, because my cardiologist told me that if I was going to commit suicide, I had to make it look like an accident. Well, if you're going to make it look like an accident, you've got to plan it every damn day, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said, boy, yeah. I had a psychiatrist mm -hmm. up there, and I had a health service person up there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I know I should have shot my mouth out, but I didn't. I didn't well, I, my mouth you know, it's good you I did. I just tell people like it is. Yeah, no. And, uh, you know, I think um, that is one of those things where certainly, um, you know, and one other thing I want, want, I just want to bring up one other thing that, you know, your situation kind of brought up to me uh, was that, and I think this is going to be a, a sort of a process that hospices will go through, but that I will probably be, you know, urging them onward. And that's whether or not to be present for the death of somebody that were to take medication. And um, it is a political reality that a, it, you know, it's sort of like the whole thing of an indiv individual has a lot more sort of freedom to think and make decision than an organization does. Because an individual, like a doctor, like me, or you, a patient, has way more ability to come to a decision about what's right for them. But an organization has a lot tougher time. That's always going to be the case. So a hospice is a organization of a lot of people, and they have a lot of different masters, <laughs> including Medicare and, and uh, board members and uh, and, and so and that, that whole thing can get very convoluted. So I don't necessarily expect a hospice to, you know, the other thing is a hospice wants to be open to everyone. They don't want to sort of, when they become, say, a pro-aid and dying hospice or an anti-aid and dying hospice, they may preclude their hospice, some people that wouldn't come to them, and they want to help people of various, they, they want to help, you know, Buddhists and, uh, you know, they want to help neo-Nazis if they're, if they get a terminal disease too. They want to help the whole spectrum. They don't want to leave people out of the benefits of hospice. So it beca becomes very difficult to um, uh, sort of maybe take a super strong stand on aid and dying. And I don't expect them to. It's kind of like asking the West Montana Clinic, a group of 50 cats, you know, that you're trying to herd to make a decision on that. It's just going to be total dysfunction, a lot of scratches and bleeding and, you know, really going to be ugly. So maybe you don't even want to go through the process of doing that. And that's probably true for, for this situation where, say, Dr. Kress, I've been in the place and time that got me to this decision to write it, but not every doctor is going to be that way, and that's okay. Not every patient is. But I really would like hospice, hospices of all stripes to become comfortable with um, dealing with a patient that would choose to use aid and dying. Because I feel that especially when you look at the situations that this is the dying process, this is how a person may choose to end their dying process, um, and um, hospice needs to be there for them at the time uh, and should become comfortable with that. And I understand that the medicine might not come from hospice, 
that could be a process that down the road in 10 years, maybe that could happen, but it's okay if that doesn't happen now. And I think, but I do wanna, I'm gonna probably be urging, you know, hospices I work with to sort of be okay with this and to support the patient and the family through this time, because I think that's really important. An example of this, um, I had a, uh, well, a patient, one of my patients that decided to take the medicine didn't want to go on hospice and he wanted to go up to a campground in the Bitterets and take the medicine there, okay? I said, no, no. We're not doing that. that. Okay, that's not happening. Huh? What's the matter with that? Well, here's what's the matter with it, okay? I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm a truth teller too, okay? The matter with it is the sheriff is going to come. <laughs> that is, you think somebody dies in Patty Canyon Campground? Right. It's suspicious. It's <laughs> They're dead. We got a dead person in Patty Canyon Campground or Greeno Park. They're going to check it out. The coroner is going to get involved. It's going to be NCIS. We're going to do drug levels. It's the death certificate is not going to come to me. It's going to go to a coroner, and a full investigation is going to be done. Do you really want that to happen for your family? I don't think most people would want that. I think we want we, when somebody goes on hospice, death is somewhat expected, and I do think you know we do have a law enforcement system, and they're duty bound to if somebody dies in a campground, excuse me, um, then they, uh, they need to find out why. Now if somebody dies at home, they're on hospice, it's an expected death, the death certificate comes to me, I sign it, you know, and everything is uh, real stress free for everybody. And hospices can help you advocate for right. where you want to die. If right. you have mm -hmm. you know, your own land and you want to be outside, that's mm -hmm. absolutely possible. Mm -hmm. He's saying to facilitate that without right. hospice helping would be difficult, difficult. for your family, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the so, family calls hospice if somebody dies under hospice care. They don't call the mm -hmm. police or the coroner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I know that that, but I do think that's where I think um, uh, really hospice is valuable and I want hospice to be present if requested it's okay for them not to be but if the family want say you have somebody who is a loner and they're all by themselves um, I certainly think the hospital could develop rules if they can't really assist them in the administration of the medication but to not to assist them with their dying process at that time I don't think is is good and I think the hospice should try to evolve towards being a part of that and not feel that they're condoning or against it either one and so that's you know that can that can take time to get there as it took me time to get to where I would write a prescription so but I, I want to encourage them to move in that direction sir do you have a question I have one other question yeah um, you mentioned uh, peer review sort of for you know, like mm -hmm. if you're making a decision that's, mm -hmm. you know, ah, am I doing the right thing? Yeah. Which is an incredibly powerful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also know that you're probably kind of alone in this medical <laughs> McCarthyism that goes on sure. here in the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I live in the rural parts and I work yeah. with rural physicians and whatnot mm -hmm. and you've spoken about this and they're, they squeamish. It's obviously, mm -hmm. even after the ruling of mm -hmm. 505, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. people are going, you know, uh, we, it might be the day, but tomorrow mm -hmm. the feds are going to come and you know pick us up. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a, there's a mm -hmm. lot of paranoia mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah. how then? You know what? It's good that they're talking about it though. So yeah, that is good. They, here's what I've done. I've talked to the preeminent legal expert on that. His name is Mark Connell, and he is the one that prosecuted the Baxter case. And I've talked to him numerous times. Uh, and I took me a while to feel comfortable too. They haven't talked to him. They haven't taken the time to go do that. I kind of understand that. And they've also gotten letters from Montanans against physician assisted suicide saying, this is not legal. You're going to get your ass thrown in jail and or prosecuted for murder. They've gotten letters that say that. So they are understandably living in a uh, world of fear. 
McCarthyism. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that um, that that ele that degree of fear is not an accident. It's <clears throat> something that Montanans against physician aid and dying have fostered and tried to make happen. Yeah. And it, it worked on me too. And you know what? I got really involved and I talked to Mark Connell and other experts on the law in this area. And uh, I also talked to, I've talked to uh, coroners about it and so Who forth. Is Mark Connell? Is he a physician? Mark Connell, he's an attorney. An attorney. Mm -hmm. For the state? No, he's a private practice physician who, who um, took the Robert Baxter case to the through the levels of the court to the Montana Supreme Court and argued it there, along with Catherine Tucker, who's the national attorney for Compassion Choices. So they are legal experts on it, and um, I've talked to him enough to feel that this is okay. You know, so I've had that benefit. I've. But it's taken me time, and it took me, you know, going out of my way to do it. And it was patient-generated because, you know, I had these patients kind of have gone through. Not to mention, I've had a more intense hospice experience than they've had too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you had a question. Go ahead. Thank you. you bet. What's your name, sir? What's your first name? George. George. Um, mm -hmm. For your family's sake, my son shot himself in the head. Mm -hmm. And uh, you want your family to be able to say goodbye. You want them to know when this is happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't want them to see that Emmy Tinder for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, something like Dr. Kress, when the time comes, um, your family can say goodbye, kiss you on the cheek, and uh, be with you. You know, don't, don't. Well, I didn't have a choice. Two years ago, I could buy myself a brand new four wheeler and I had a track on. I went up on it, not six miles of ice. I pulled it up and stopped, tried to climb back, got stuck. So I, I bought my machine from 2.30 in the afternoon until 9.30 that night. And I realized I wasn't going to get it out. So I started walking off and dividing the highway, the sign says 11 miles. Mm -hmm. But I took two shortcuts, so I probably cut it down to eight and a half. Mm -hmm. But I started walking at 9.30 that night and I got down to the road 200 yards from my neighbor's house, eight o'clock the next morning. Mm -hmm. And I fell a hundred times coming mm -hmm. off of that hill. Mm -hmm. And so I figured that if I, I've always been a gun lover and I don't believe in shooting yourself, but it may come to the point to where I won't be able to do anything else because the only thing I can see if I'm going to die legally is just to take my four-wheeler and go somewhere where I know I can't get out. Mm -hmm. Or to go out sometime in the wintertime, because on top of all my other problems, I got Reynolds syndrome, so I only got three to eight minutes when it's ten above, and I'm, I'm, my fingers don't even move. I can't even undo a zipper or nothing. So I'm going to die anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to quit running my four wheeler until I have to. They're my feet. <laughs> yeah. They're my feet. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions or anything? You know, it's imminent that if a person is dying, you, you should be able to make your own choice on what you want to do. Like you can take your dog to the vets, get a little shot, and they're gone. Mm -hmm. No suffering at all. Mm -hmm. That should be legal for everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know what you want to do if you let your yeah. uh, That's what I feel about it personally because everybody Everybody in the world, some of us is dying from, from uh, eating too much, some of us dying from drinking too much. <laughs> so what difference does it make if it's if it's if it's still a suicide because everybody knows that health issues can still come back more so than on a person that doesn't take care of themselves. I took care of myself most of my life. Mm -hmm. 
and it didn't make a bit of difference with this that parking. Mm -hmm. But uh, somebody that says that you shouldn't end your life has never had their feet nailed to the floor. Mm -hmm. And then you go to move and you fall. Mm -hmm. You can be three feet away from the cupboard and you're still going to plaster against that damn cupboard. Mm -hmm. I fought a few hundred times in the last 18 months. And uh, 50 of those at least are just full blown over backwards, mm -hmm. crashing down. Mm -hmm. It's not fun. It's fun to talk. Yeah. It's, it's really, um, Hang in there, George. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is, it is true that we'll all have to find ways to, you know, we, we all, as we're, when we're younger, we all celebrate our youthful um, exuberance and all the things we can enjoy physically. And then as things go on, like Parkinson's or just getting older and stuff, we have to kind of let that go. And um, obviously relationships become the most important thing because the physical side of things, unless you enjoyed that hike through the woods at, in the middle of the night, I don't think that was probably, you probably feel proud of it. It's like, I man, I made it. it. Was but yeah. <laughs> but, but there was but, one time I looked at this ticket and I thought, you know, you're, this is a perfect time. It's a nice place and just go in there and draw in there. But I don't think it was cold enough. I might have yeah. heard of that, but I don't think it was cold enough. <laughs> Well, the only thing I was going to say is that sometimes that's where I think the whole hospice approach allows people to really work on their relationships with people uh, and their uh, and feel love and understanding, and uh, that is really important, I guess. The the, the and like I say, some of us were probably better at say just being physical and going out and killing an elk and feel good about it that worked for a long time and but when we we're all going to get beaten down to the point where we can't do that and what are we going to do then so we have to the the people that succeed often have found a way to work on their relationships and 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 hospice if it gets bad i'd really encourage you to think about hospice we do have people that go on hospice with Parkinson's disease. And it can, you can explore these things in more detail. And I think good things can happen for you uh, with um, addressing these issues, as well as even maybe, uh, maybe you could be a candidate for this medication. But I think to not go through the process of discussion, it would be hard to to get comfortable for me or uh, for the system to sort of allow you to have that option. So that's why, you know, there definitely can be times that uh, um, it is, you know, they make you sign a statement that somebody's going to die in six months, but I've signed it numerous times and had people get off hospice and if they're going to throw me in jail for that, they would have done it a long time ago. So it's okay to to sort of be wrong on that. Uh, we can't ignore that sort of statement, but on the other hand, we can um, use it such that, well, if there's a good chance they might die in six months, then we can get somebody on hospice. And that's, I, I think that could be a good situation for you, you know, at some point in time. I don't know when, but at some point. Right. And talk to your doctor about it, because you know, some doctors are good at it, at referring you to hospice appropriately and early, and others are lousy at it. And if you give them some preparation, they'll be better at it. <laughs> yeah, he's good. Hospice out there, he probably saved my life, actually. Because in October last year, I turned my four wheeler over top of me. And I got a P4, D9, five ribs. Mm -hmm. And when I told him, let's see, I told him the year before that I was going to have to take myself out of the picture of my damn Parkinson's 
for that. <laughs> no, George, you can't do that. You can't do that. So anyway, why? I went in to my cardiologist on my birthday a couple of years ago, and he told me, he said, well, he said, since you've had a pacemaker put in, you've been sinus rhythm now for a year and a half, so he said, yeah, if you want to go off and do me, you can. So I did. And then I had a physical with Dr. Caldwell two days later. I asked him, I said, now, should I go off and come in or should I stay on it? And he said, well, I said, I advise you to get off from it. And I said, well, I don't want a stroke. Mm -hmm. You know what I gotta do, and I can't do it if I got a stroke. So well, I said, you better stay on two minutes. Then. But if I had stayed on two minutes, he would have been my ticket out of this proposal. <laughs> said I would have bled out. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if I would have or not, but they said I would have probably. Yeah, could have happened. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. anybody else have anything they want to bring up? Eric. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm about ready, Mom and I are about ready to redo her mm -hmm. her living will. Mm -hmm. Could she put in that, um, if she were to get senile, mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to put this, that either Chris or I could make the decision for a cocktail? <laughs> no. <laughs> the answer uh, that that really can't happen under the current law. Okay. So if she doesn't have her faculties um, or is senile, then she can't make the decision herself. And um, you, I wouldn't. It would be potentially illegal to do that. Okay. What about if somebody has their faculties? Can you sign something that says? I want this done when I'm starting to lose it. So then you've already <clears throat> legally had the signature on paper while you were still with it. Call no, it no. That that, doesn't uh, that, that wouldn't be legal according to the Baxter decision, or uh, because it has to be the person deciding it and actually administering the medicine themselves. So that would not be one that I would. Right Next for that. week we're going to rewrite her. Mm -hmm. She has a pretty good mm -hmm. living will now, but we're going to rewrite it. Mm -hmm. Is there one or two things that you can say to be sure to be on that? Well, just I think make it clear that if you um, don't want life extending things done, such as tube feeding, um, antibiotics for pneumonia, um, she's got that yeah and and so forth the other thing I tell people when you sign those advanced directives and things if let's say let's say you're fully cognizant now and you and you sign it that says no antibiotics and you get pneumonia now mm -hmm. and you you ask the patient do you want antibiotics and they say yes then you give them antibiotics the form only works if they are not of sound mind. So it's sort of one of those things. I think if you know, I you know, look at the pulse, even for myself, I say, well, the, the only way the pulse really comes into play is if I'm brain dead or close to it or demented, right? So there's two different forms we're mm -hmm. talking about here, and I think what's really important mm -hmm. for you, especially if your mom is close, within like six mm -hmm. months is the general standard, or within mm -hmm. the next year, would you be surprised mm -hmm. if she were to pass away? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, I wouldn't be surprised if mom or my loved one or I would pass away in the next 12 months. You need to go to your doctor and ask for what's called pulse mm -hmm. that, that Dr. Preston has called a mm -hmm. provider order for life-sustaining treatment. Mm -hmm. and, and how I'd like people to think about it, and legally you should think mm -hmm. about it, is a prescription for a DNR mm -hmm. or a prescription for what you want. Well, she's already a DNR. Yeah. So good. an advanced directive is something that every single person in this room should have, mm -hmm. and it says, if I can't make my choice, here's what I want, or if I can't make my choice, here's who I want to make that choice. Okay, that's that's oh, what an advanced directive okay, says yeah. for every yeah, single one of us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you're talking about yeah. life-sustaining treatment and the end of life, if you're within that one year or you've been given the terminal diagnosis and you have strong feelings about what you want done or don't want done, 
That's the only order that's going to get you out of having an ambulance crew or a medical personnel not perform those orders for you. And there's very clear instructions on it that says, um, right, right now it says, do not, not right now it says, um, resuscitate and do not resuscitate. Mm -hmm. And then there's also additional areas that say, if I'm not dead, you don't have to worry about resuscitating, but I'm on my way dying. What do I want done? Take me to the hospital? Don't take me to the hospital. Leave me home and give me comfort only. And then there's another section that says, I want antibiotics, I don't want antibiotics. That form is going to change, and one of the things I was going to say is we're actually looking at changing the language, and, and this is a statewide initiative, from resuscitate and do not resuscitate to attempt resuscitation and allow natural death. And the reason is, is because we're trying to shift our mind towards we're already fighting something that that is inevitable. So, you know, using that thought of attempt resuscitation because it's not guaranteed number one, and allow natural death because it's not that it's not that you're not you know you're not withdrawing something. You're simply allowing natural death. Right. So I think that that's an important distinction between advanced directives, which all of us should have. And a pulse, which is something that someone needs to talk to their provider about getting so that a resuscitation isn't attempted if someone doesn't want it. Is it P U L S T? P O L S T, provider order for life sustaining treatment. Is that what goes on the And that's that comment. It's a signed physician order, so it supersedes the 911 protocol. Will they have that at St. Pat's? I'm going down to the first floor. With they, no, not, not, don't, you have to get it from a provider, it has to be signed by a provider because it's like a prescription. The other thing I would say is that in addition to that, whoever the power of attorney for health care, when you're not able to speak for yourself, that person is able to speak for you. So you need to just have a discussion with what you want done, what's on your piece of paper, and your next person in line needs to be able to speak for your wishes, knowing exactly what you want, and, and your physician should be able to back up that conversation that you had. Now, is there a hospice that goes two years or are they all six months? Sometimes they, you think you're going to die. Yeah, you're, no, you're all of them will go beyond the six month threshold. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's where um, it it is, um, you know, that can happen over 30% of the time probably. And then uh, probably 20 or 30% of the time, people come off hospice, too. Mm -hmm. And it's not a precise um, uh, decision. It's a shade of gray decision. But I don't want to keep people that need it from the benefit if it's going to help them. And so it is um, often there are shades of gray issues that come up with it. But uh, you know, if you're it's, it's very difficult to um, sort of say uh, without, with a casual or brief look at somebody's clinical situation whether they would qualify for hospice and that's why it certainly would be reasonable to have hospice professionals come and look over a situation and see if it's the right time or not. So, yeah. And I guess the important part is to but say it wouldn't that's be not something, a hospice yeah. decision, that's a Medicare decision. Yeah, Medicare yeah. Medicare yeah. is the one that gives us the guidelines that we mm -hmm. operate under. So it's not that any hospice is going to come and say, yeah, no, we don't think so. We have mm -hmm. guidelines that we follow mm -hmm. that say what the criteria are. So though that is our master in one way. You sure. know, and, you, and that's available to you to see. Anyone can see that. Mm -hmm. And we'll come out at any time to do an assessment and to give you advice. I mean, that's part of what hospice does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if it goes beyond that period of time that's anticipated, you know, there are certain junctures where there's recertifications where we have to continually, you know, assess and monitor and, and document that somebody is still eligible or still in the criteria uh, for hospice. And that's where when Dr. Kress mentions that some people graduate is they actually improve and they don't qualify any longer. So the scenarios are very varied. But you can go back on. Yep. Yeah. 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 They also, interestingly, they also had a study of advanced cancer that, um, and I forget the details around it, but the people that went on palliative care sooner live longer. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really one of those things, and they're trying to scratch in their heads over that one. But uh, 
that seemed like a pretty clear conclusion. Uh, and they also lived better. So that's the real important thing. But they also lived longer for whatever reason. They haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> that's the way life is. You don't figure everything out. <laughs> Get you're talking about cults, and I only know of the five wishes, yet the, term, a lot of the terminology sounds the same. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Different? Yeah, it's difficult, no question. And so, so five wishes in an advanced directive form that any of us could be using. The cults is the, the state-honored medical order from a physician or a provider, saying TMR. Mm -hmm. That's and the one that goes on your fridge, it's bright neon or, or green. Green, right. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in advanced directives, most advanced directives say, if I have a terminal condition, this is what I want. Mm -hmm. And what um, ambulance people can't do is show up at your house while you're laying on the floor and decide if you have a terminal condition that proceeds then from doing CPR on you. Mm -hmm. So what this form says is that if I have that event and I end up in the hospital and after the two-week trial mm -hmm. of the tube feed and my mm -hmm. doctor's still saying, you're not going to make it, you're brain dead, or you're, if you do make it, it's a terrible life you're facing, then your family knows Oh, I can look back on this advanced directive and see clearly that my loved one doesn't want to be kept in this state. Whereas, if you have the green form, because you've already had the discussion, you already know you have a life-limiting illness, and you've made the choice in sound mind and with your doctor to say, um, I'm okay, natural death is good, let that happen, or make me comfortable while it happens. The green form is what you have to have in order for the ambulance or the paramedics to step back and not perform that. So they can't make that terminal choice yeah. in the moment that has to be their life medical. <coughs> yeah. Okay, well, we're coming up around the eight. So mm -hmm. what we do in closing for all community conversations, we have a lot of people here, so be brief. But we go around the room and just introduce ourselves if you're comfortable using your name. And to say sort of one thing that we take away with us from conversations like this, and maybe how you'll pass along the things that you've learned to other people, because that's why we're doing conversations, and so that we can start talking about it. So don't let that stop here. You know, take that with you into the community. I think that that's really important. So I'm going to put you under the pressure of the oh, uh, <laughs> I'm John. Um, gives me a little more perspective on dying. Our son died two months ago. Um, I'm not sure I got the instructions, but my name is Annette. Um, and our son was in hospice care in Colorado, and I was with him the last two months of his life. And um, so I'm a real believer in what hospice does. and. Um, what Dr. Kress is involved in, and I will take that away from this discussion tonight. I'm Kay, and I found this very, very informative, and how I maybe, maybe can help mom um, make it a little easier for her. I'm Helen, and uh, we had hospice when my father died, and everybody I think that has hospice says, I wish I would have got you sooner. Mm -hmm. And uh, he died peacefully, and no pain at that time. There wasn't the assistant medical help, but I still, at that time, he was in so much pain, they had to give him so much medication mm -hmm. that he just slipped away, and it was peaceful. and. We got to say goodbye. But George, I hope you get involved with hospice. That's my prayer. Go ahead. We'll put inner circle, outer circle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Carolyn. I'm just so glad I came tonight. Thank you very much, and sure. uh, thank all of you who participated. Very meaningful. My name is Ron Sharp. I'm a combat vet from New Jersey. And uh, I got thinking about. The 1,500 of us that are losing a day, that's why I'm here to get some pointers. I got to beat that guy in Great Falls. He was only 113, so I got to make it to 114. My name is Randy Bruins, and I'm a retired <coughs> nurse RN, and 
I do a lot of consulting up on the res, and there's like a lot of questions, and I also have a family member, and I'm so enlightened and, and emboldened mm -hmm. into the vernacular and how decisions are made that I did not know, so I'm mm -hmm. very indebted. Thank you very, very much. My name is George, and I want to tell the doctor how much I respect him going out on a limb against that other big boy. <laughs> <laughs> because I still feel real strongly that a person, it's his body, damn it, and you got a right to die when you want to die at your discretion. And so, I just lost my wife four years ago. Oh. And I had people of choice, they called it then, but I. I can't say enough that if anybody doesn't have all of these paperwork in order, you're making the biggest mistake of your life because she had a blood clot on her brain. Mm -hmm. And then from the, that evening until the next morning, she didn't recognize me. And so they put a tube in her, even though we had it in the, the people's choice. But it used to be the people's choice, and it was in the library in the same path that. Well, they had transferred it to, to Helena, apparently, because the doctors couldn't find it. They said, you guys sure you made him out? I said, yeah, I know we made him out. So I brought them the copies. And as quick as they realized that it was Lego, they pulled the feeding tube and moved her to the fifth floor. And that's the telling time. <laughs> She died six days later, but she was on morphine, so she didn't know anything, which was a godsend, mm -hmm. because I thought this was supposed to assist the death that you're going to get. Yeah. And, and interest. all legal. There was nothing ever said about it, and I thought, how yeah. come people having so much trouble with it? Yeah. There, there are uh, some lawsuits being initiated by Compassionate Choices because of failure to adhere to people's advanced directives. And so that's an issue that Compassion Choices has taken up, is to sort of say, because people have ignored advanced directives and treated them much more aggressively than they wish to have done, and they're trying to, to sort of uh, penalize that and make them realize that this is a real issue and you can't just ignore these. So, there there is some movement on that too. I'm I know about advanced directives, and I encourage my patients to sell them out. Um, my mother passed away last year. Unfortunately, she was not under hospice care with Alzheimer's. Had a bad death. My father was sick in December, got on hospice when discharged from the hospital. He just got kicked off of hospice yesterday <laughs> at 90 and a half. Um, and um, I've always believed that people should have the, the right to make their decision towards the end of life. So. My name is Cindy Peters, and I'm a nurse at hospice. And I would love to be the hospice house for you to hear the story of Mary Tyson. I was going to say, I would be the hospice house for you to hear the story of Mary Tyson. Get her phone number, George. <laughs> also one of the nurses that works with Hospice in Missoula and I couldn't be here earlier because of a family obligation but I wanted to come up and I just can't say what a gift it's been to me in my life to be a hospice nurse. It's an honor. My name is Lauren Dill and I work with uh, Home Instead Senior Care. It's an in-home non-medical um, company and we work a lot with the um, hospice companies in town and uh, I'm just learning more every day. 
I'm Mary, and I work at St. Patrick Hospital, part of the spiritual care team, providing music for patients. And I'm just thinking about the comments about what we do for animals. No. Uh, we call that humane. Right. And uh, just to continually reflect upon what's humane for us humans. Yeah, my name is Lawrence Duncan. I work with Hospice of Missoula as a music pathologist. And, um, um, you know, what, what Eric said about physicians as a group being um, influenced, at least, by public opinion um, seems really significant and important to me. And the fact that we can have these conversations um, will help us. Actually, you know, human beings have been dying for a long time. <laughs> we, really, we really need to, to reclaim our confidence in not needing to rely upon professionals for understanding the whole picture. That's, a, that's, that's something I think we can really consider. Nan back there. I'm Nan Byington. I'm also a hospice of Missoula RN case manager, and um, I'm just really glad that we're having conversations. It's complex, and we need we need the language, like Randy said, and uh, like Lawrence said. So we, we do need to take back our uh, responsibility and our personal authority for how every event in our life goes. And professionals appropriately for their expertise and then um, do what you got to do. conversations I've been coming for almost since it started. I have on the hat of 82 and 84 year old parents. They are my children and just helping them cope with the end of their life. This has been very helpful. 
And my other hat, as Dr. Cressa said, is compassion and choices. So really following the issue in Montana very closely through this legislative session and hearing so many, so many amazing stories. And I just thank you all for being, for being open and being here tonight. I'm Amber, I'm a hospice volunteer, and I was raised in Oregon, so I'm a little baffled that there aren't 15 doctors lined up behind yeah, you really saying this is yeah. something we advocate for and this is everyone's right. <coughs> I'm Diane Peterson. I am a retired nurse who has about four hours logged in with Hospice of Missoula as a volunteer. And um, what I gained tonight was perspective. It's really important for me to educate myself um, for when I do visit people so I'll know what they're talking about. And um, I really appreciate the personal stories tonight because um, it really brings to light um, what you're talking about. Hi, my name's Larry. Uh, it's been an eye-opener for me. Uh, I know that the people who are involved in the hospice are special people. Not everybody can do this. Not everybody wants to do this. But thank God somebody's doing it. into health care because my grandparents, like Amy's parents, it sounds like, were, are still my most precious things. Um, and we did um, have hospice for my grandpa last year. And I work in it every day because I feel like everybody is somebody's grandpa or grandma. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have those little people, someone has to advocate and look out. So I'm just, I'm super inspired because I get caught up in a lot of the day-to-day paperwork and all those other things that we get tied to and then um, this just fills my bank. So thanks for everybody inspiring me. And I gotta get my generation here somehow. That's the other part of it. Yeah. Gotta get my generation here somehow. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I'm Terry Steckley. Um, I uh, work for Hospice in Missoula as well. Um, I'm an RN and um, I have the privilege of being one of the people that gets to meet families and patients for the very first time and hear their story. And together with a social worker, explain um, hospice philosophy and care and what it will mean to them and what we hope to provide them in the way of support. Always letting them know that they're in charge. They get to make the choices and we kind of follow through. Um, um, so um, I'm taking away two things tonight. And the first is that um, how far we still have to go and Dr. Kress is, um, uh, talked to us tonight, lets us know that physicians are not jumping on the bandwagon um, to allow patients to make those end of life choices. Um, and I wasn't surprised when he said that, you know, not very many are coming out of visible support because we are still, um, we are still educating a lot of physicians just to accept hospice in general, hmm. hospice care in those hmm. last months of life hmm. and, and what it can offer. And um, so, so each one, reach one, that's what I'll say to you tonight. Mm -hmm. take, take the word onward with you. Then the other thing is that I found whenever I've been in groups is that it's very easy to talk to strangers about things sometimes that are really close and important to you. And it's really hard to talk to your family members about those very things. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping tonight that it'll give you some courage to go home and talk to your children, your spouses, um, any of your loved ones that need to hear kind of where you're at in this. And make sure they know uh, really early on what you're thinking about it. I hope this, this talk tonight will make that easier for you. So before I let Anita and Eric say their um, piece, which I'm sure you're both very moved, yeah is um, that we do hold these conversations monthly. So it's always on the third Thursday of every month in the same location. So be sure to watch for that. And if you don't even know what it's going to be, I'm sure it'd be wonderful. You can always just show up. But it will always be in the paper that Tuesday before. We have an article that will tell you what the topic is if you're curious about that. There's a sign-in sheet here. We send out an email blast so you can have information about when this happens if you'd like that too. And starting in July, we're going to start doing something called the Death Cafe. 
and that is during the day, and it'll be um, at Buttercup Cafe from 10 to noon. And a little bit less structured, we will have speakers that come and a topic, but staff will be there from Hospice of Missoula, and you can certainly come have a cup of coffee and whatever it is that you like from Buttercup Cafe, and just talk about anything. So anything, anything that will come up around end of life. So it's a very interesting philosophy that started in Europe, and you know the East Coast has really adopted that, and we're trying to embrace that here. I think this is a great way to do it too, but sometimes people can't make it at night, so we're trying to make that more available in our community just to have those simple discussions. So. If you're interested, there are flyers there that you can take with you. And thank you so much for coming. I mean, it's very meaningful. I hope you understand that. So you, all you. Um, well, for me, this discussion and just even gearing up to sit down and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, be a part of this, uh, it's really about hearing mm -hmm. the people's stories and, you know, also kind of embodying for our work what that informed neutrality mm -hmm. and the idea that you know, our mm -hmm. patient-centered care really can encompass a lot, and there's always more to learn and more to uh, <laughs> incorporate into our practices when we're working with end-of-life situations and families and individuals. And so I'm just grateful to hear, you know, everybody's perspective and, mm -hmm. and get um, a better, fuller feeling about, you know, where people are coming from, both on the aid and dying and just, you know, hospice and dying in general. Um, well, it's been really, um, as, as I first came out with the issue, it was scary, but then as, as, as it's been so much, this issue has really generated a lot of great discussion and um, in all realms of end-of-life care. Um, and I felt very supported, such that for me personally, the whole journey has been very uplifting and um, personally gratifying. Um, it's kind of recharged my, you know, your batteries get kind of low at age 57 and been, been, been fighting the good fight for trying to get the, keep the flagpole up like a you know, GMF for 27 years and you get kind of, but this has actually kind of been a, a positive for me to kind of recharge my batteries and uh, so it's been good. Um, and, and it's, it's the other thing I would say though is um, one thing that I've learned is that the people in this room are people that care and think about this issue probably way more than most people. And there's a big group of people in the middle when we've inf used our educational processes to talk about the issue, they turns out that really most people agree with the issue regarding aid and dying. But that there are, um, and that, but without the, with me just showing up the Senate Judiciary Committee and giving the talk, <coughs> my voice would have been, you know, a good speech that is now dead and gone. But compassion and choices um, really magnified that voice in in a major way and they they did spend over two hundred thousand um, dollars in Montana now a lot of that money came from out of state these are people from all over the country that donated money to sort of fight this battle in this state so I would say I would just encourage you to consider if you um, really want a promotion of debate about these issues both aid and dying as well as just getting advanced directives followed, which sometimes they've been blatantly and egregiously ignored, um, that you consider making a donation for whatever feels comfortable to you to Compassion and Choices because it is a voice that if you do that, not only will you learn a lot because they'll send you a lot of information, as always <laughs> happens, but that you will also be a person that's participating in educating the country um, about this issue and they do it in ways that to be honest without the media involved where you can really reach out to people in smart ways you don't reach people one-on-one -on -one that near as well as, as Compassion Choices did. So my impact on this situation was magnified you know 300 percent by Compassion Choices 
wisely um, influencing people by advertising. And I, I, I was reading um, a politician's um, take on that, that's sort of anti, you know, or they were uh, Montanans for against aid in, or against physician assisted suicide. They were complaining about how we're this big, giant lobbying organization and we're spending this massive amount of money. Compassion Choices spent $200,000. They did not give money to one candidate. They did not buy anybody lunch. Oh, I maybe got a couple lunches out of it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they spent money influencing people. And you know what? The people influenced their legislators because they achieved a come from behind win by really getting um, bipartisan support for a bill that was just going to be sort of lockstep everybody vote you know if you're if you're a democrat you vote against house bill 505 if you're republican you vote for it and if you don't you're we're going to throw you know we're going to throw you out in the next primary so they made it they made their legislators sort of go, well, maybe I shouldn't just vote party line. Maybe I should think about this. And you know, by the way, all these people are calling in and saying, don't vote for House Bill 505. So that's why I would encourage you to consider joining Compassion and Choices because you will be joining a small percent of the population that influences a huge percent of the population. And um, so think about that because it is a, uh, it's a, it's a lean, mean uh, machine. I was out visiting Barbara Coombs Lee in um, Portland. They've got an office space about the size of Hospice Missoula or Partners, and the executive director has a eight by 10 office that is not fancy. They put their money out here in, in, the, in the hinterlands, and so it's a very good organization, and uh, I feel strongly that they really, with, that, with me just showing up, it would have been real easy for those legislators just to go, just to say, you know, I told this guy I was going to vote this way and I'm going to do it, but instead they got 500 phone calls and they said, you know, I'm not, and, and this is kind of like, why are we doing this? Why, are, why is the government telling people how to die or not die? Should we be doing this? And so, you know, it worked, the system worked, which was great. It was awesome, it was really uplifting. So, think about that. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for coming. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.